great. Welcome everyone. We are so excited to uh, be together today. We have so much to cover. So we're gonna jump right in. The slides and the recording and all of the resources are going to be shared in a follow-up follow up email. The <laughs> more to come as we plan for Citizen Science Month. So um, if you miss anything today, don't worry. There's plenty of opportunities to, to learn about it in some way or another. Robin, are you, you're letting people into the, to the room, right? I can keep going. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Awesome. So for those who may not know what citizen science is and, or, or community science, as some folks call it, oops, it is a global movement that enables people from all walks of life to participate in real scientific research in collaboration with scientists. And it's how people are making a difference globally from topics like um, Alzheimer's research to um, climate change to uh, looking at local bird and, and pollinator populations. There's even this amazing citizen science project where um, folks were sent uh, little swabs of their belly button and bacteria in and we learned that we have thousands of new bacteria in our belly button. Couldn't have done it without the citizen scientists, real people uh, collaborating with scientists. So what we've done is launched the, the, citizen, the National Citizen and Community Science Library Network. Um, and this network is a growing network of libraries and other interested community-based organizations that are coming together to become community hubs for citizen science, to house resources, to be a place of learning for their communities so that we can expand uh, and broaden the reach of citizen science and, and those participating in scientific research. So you can sign up for the network if you haven't already signed up on scistarter.org forward slash library dash network. And Robin's going to be the link, um, the link fairy today and adding all of these links to the chat. So thank you, Robin. So what is Citizen Science Month? This is what we're gonna be celebrating in April. Oops, my, my uh, out of order there. Citizen Science Month is a celebration of citizen and community science in April, featuring thousands of events hosted by libraries and community organizers like you. You are the folks that make Citizen Science Month what it is. And we are so, so grateful to the National Institutes of Health and the National Library, the ne National Network for the Libraries of Medicine for um, enabling us to be able to come together and fund Citizen Science Month for the next four years. So I'm curious, let me put up uh, another poll. Who has participated in the past in Citizen Science Month? Have you hosted or coordinated an event? Have you just attended an event? Or have you never participated in Citizen Science Month in the past? see who is here with us. All right, so it looks like most people on the call have not participated in Citizen Science Month before. So we are hoping that today inspires you to get involved. We, we are going to be sharing a bunch of different ways to be able to get involved in Citizen Science Month. Um, and for those who have participated, whether you've attended an event or coordinated or hosted an event, we want to hear from you. Let us know in the chat how these events went, what were some of the, the successes you've had, what were some barriers you've had. Um, let you, the rest of your network know. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Robin in just a second, but we've thought through some steps, not that you have to do these in order, but uh, some steps in uh, for how to um, host and plan and introduce citizen science to your community. So that's what we're gonna be sharing with you today. I'm gonna turn it over to Robin, who is first gonna take you through introducing citizen science to your community. Go for it, Robin. Thanks, Tara. So one of the best ways to get started is to use all the downloadable assets that SciStarter has created. For instance, rack cards, flyers and bookmarks, some which are even available in the Spanish language as seen by that bookmark on the right. And we have lots of different posters. Some are interactive, so you can start getting answers for how engaged or what your community has already done in citizen science. These are great assets to use in displays for um, book or for bulletin boards, even for outreach activities you may do 
be doing. In the next screen, we'll see how a librarian in Oregon has actually used these assets to create a bulletin board. So next slide, please. So she is holding one of our citizen science flyers, citizen science month flyers that highlights um, several of the projects that um, people can do. She's also created a big poster showing projects that she's developed events around and promoting them to her audience. In the next slide, we'll see that um, libraries can even do this through story time. So next slide. So there's lots of books, even for young children that are great for story times and can segue to introducing kits if you decide to bring kits into your um, library and um, you know, promote them as a great activity for families. And um, book discussions are other, another good way to get started in citizen science. Of course, we recommend the Field Guide to Citizen Science, which is co-authored by Darlene Cavalier. And this book explains the, what citizen science is about. It focuses on projects, including um, a project per month. YouTube has lots of interviews with Darlene and especially one by PBS Books. And I always found when I've done book discussions, my audience loves hearing the author's perspective. So you can use these video clips or you can run the whole video as an event from your library. Next slide. Well, Robert, I just wanted to mention quickly that we have some book lists as well that we have curated. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about those? Sure. So um, there's three book lists that we'll make available to you. And they recently updated them with uh, titles and in some cases even videos that would fit into general citizen science themes, astronomy, and pollination. Of course, these are just guides and you can um, take these formatted uh, lists for both Citizen Science Month and year round and make them um, relevant to your collection. So um, yeah, make sure when we provide those links that you take advantage of those either to develop your collection or maybe to use as a guide in a display or book discussion. Next slide. And then finally, a great way to get started with citizen science for citizen science month or year round is to take advantage of the free online training. Everyone should start out with the foundations of citizen science that explains the who, what, where, why of citizen science. It also gets you started in creating a SciStarter account and actually contributing to two citizen science projects. I would encourage library staff then to move on to the libraries as community hubs for citizen science. This course will give you more confidence and other resources to um, become facilitators in your community for citizen science. And we provide such things as a slide deck, as you see on the right, with sp speaker notes that can be adapted to fit your audiences and event needs. Both of these online courses take around an hour to do, to do and once you've completed them, you get access to downloading these awesome badges that show the world you've um, accomplished some great skills in taking them and they can be shared on um, social media platforms. So with that, I'm going to turn the program back over to Tara. Thank you so much, Robin. I'm curious um, for those folks that have introduced citizen science to their communities before, what are some ways that you have introduced uh, the concept of citizen and community science? Let us know in the chat. Um, those trainings are great not only for the library staff um, and your, your um, not just libraries, but if you're at a community-based organization, your staff to take, but also to send out to your audience to get familiar with citizen science. Paula said she can't hear me. Is anybody else having issues with hearing me? Okay. Anne yeah. and Kirsten and Rebecca said they can't hear me. Oh, thank you. Okay. Paula, you may want to test audio on your end. 
Uh, so Dolores says backyard bird count, snow depth. Absolutely. So thinking about some different projects. Um, Kenny says, I integrated into our science cafe program by asking scientists with citizen science projects to present. I love that. That's a great um, idea. We actually, you know, we should highlight that more integrating citizen science into already existing programming is um, a way to be able to just start to introduce, right? The, we encourage you if you, um, you might not want to host an, an event during citizen science, but there are certainly ways to participate in citizen science month. Um, like hosting the book display or just getting your audience familiar with the concept and signing up for SciStarter um, to get an account and to check out what projects are out there. Someone also asked about the resources. So yes, all of these resources are on SciStarter.org. Um, there's also CitizenScienceMonth.org, which we are currently revising. And it's gonna be a brand new website or a brand new design for this year featuring all of these resources really nicely laid out for you. So we're gonna send you that once that website is um, available. But right now, all of these resources can be found in, on either SciStarter.org or CitizenScienceMonth.org. So the next sort of step after introducing the concept of citizen science to your audience is really thinking about what projects you should be focusing on. And we really encourage you to actually ask your community what topics are of interest to them. The, the point of citizen science is to get people engaged in the science that matters to them. Um, and there are thousands and thousands of projects. So on SciStarter, we've curated them uh, on this project finder. So you can go through and you can search by project location. So there are projects that are hyper-local that might be right there in your backyard. There are global projects um, that are happening um, across all subject areas, as I mentioned before, from astronomy to health sciences to um, to birds, backyard birds, as Phyllis is mentioning, and Dolores. Um, so you can go and search. You can search by age group, depending on which audience you want to reach. But we really also encourage you to go that extra step and, and ask your audience through either a survey, which we have a sample survey that we'll, we can provide to you, uh, host a listening session or a focus group, talk to local um, leaders about what's happening in your community and what is a, as of interest to them. So that is kind of the first step is thinking about from all of these thousands of projects, which ones do you really want to focus on? We have thought through some of this and also just based on what we have been hearing uh, libraries and community-based organizations using and which projects are really accessible and engaging for their communities. So we've curated the list here. Again, you're going to get all of these slides. You're going to get information to this list is going to live online on that new website. Um, so you're going to get all of this information and many of these projects you may already be familiar with. But these are sort of there's indoor and outdoor projects um, that we've thought through in in and a lot of these have additional resources that go along with them, whether that is guides to hosting events um, or additional activities that we've developed or that Starnet um, has curated and thinking through how, you know, other additional STEM activities to go with these. So let's see what Pamela says. I run a community garden that focuses on pollinators. Wonderful. So think about what is exactly right there in your community and where these projects might be able to fit in. And it's really about setting up the, um, the time, the space, the resources for your community to actually contribute to the data. It's great for them to get um, interested and involved in citizen science, but how can you as a community space take it one step further and actually help them to contribute to the data? One of those ways is just by simply featuring the widget on your organization homepage where folks can go um, and create their SciStarter account and start contributing to data on their own. So uh, if you go to SciStarter.org uh, forward slash widget forward slash new, you can add that widget right to your, and there's some instructions there for adding it right to your organization's homepage. The other way that we encourage is by really hosting events that provide the time and the space and the resources to contribute and, and uh, an engaging environment and an exciting environment to contribute to, to these different um, types of citizen science projects. So we've thought through some event types um, and which projects are really good to kind of fit in with these event types. I'm just looking at the chat to, to, to because you are all all doing this work and I just want to um, acknowledge that. So we are coordinating our citizen science activities with the city's Earth Day and Arbor Day programs. Amazing. I think that's a perfect connection to, to kind of leverage what's already going on and for that collective impact. 
So one type of event is um, inviting a speaker, a subject matter expert to inspire and inform your audience. Now, something that we heard is that subject matter experts don't necessarily need to be the project scientist or uh, an astronaut. They can be local members of your community, beekeepers, um, school teachers. Expand your idea of what a subject matter uh, is and look for, for ones right there in your local community. You can also find subject matter experts on a bunch of different um, websites, one of which is a sorry, SciStarter website, the People Finder. We also, the National Girls Collaborative Project, which is the organization that I also represent, runs a database of, of um, female uh, role models in STEM, which are happy to virtually or in person, depending on where the location is, go and, and inspire and talk to folks. NASA Night Sky Network has a database of amateur astronomers uh, that will go out or, or talk virtually. So think about who you can bring in to inspire and inform your audience. We also encourage you at a speaker event to have citizen science kits with the actual resources and tools needed to participate in the citizen science projects, like computers, um, tablets. I'm gonna show you what these kits are next. We have six project kits right now, um, build a kit guides that have all of the materials that you need um, to be able to, uh, for, for patrons to check out um, or members of your community to use to contribute the data to these projects. Um, and we've thought through some of these projects like the iNaturalist project, the pollinators, um, the Great Sunflower project, the Globe at Night project. So there are kits with, we have, we've curated a list of where and, and resources where you can build these kits on your own and have them. We really encourage that. Let's see, Christine said, here in Nashville, we have an active seed exchange program and several, several library gardens. We could introduce gardening and botany as science too. It is absolutely science. And that, you know, maybe it's not just expanding your idea of what a subject matter expert is, but really expanding our idea of what science is. Thank you. These are great um, conversations happening in the chat. Another type of event that you may have heard of is a bio blitz, which is, um, an event in which teams of volunteers come together um, at, at a time and place to identify as many living species of plants and animals, the flora and fauna of your area as possible. Um, so what you can do is organize a meeting at a local park. This contributes really well to the iNaturalist project, which is um, you can download the app or have tablets ready for your audience to uh, contribute to the data. Delara says, we have done a bio blitz. I'm curious, bio blitz is very popular. Um, who else has, has attempted a bio blitz and how did it go? What recommendations would you give to others? Tell us in the chat. We have that observing biodiversity uh, build a kit guide with all of the tools that you might need for a bio blitz. So you can build those kits and have them there. Invite local experts. Oh, Dolores says the tip is find someone who knows the app well. Absolutely, that's a great tip. And you can even do this as a two-part event. Maybe the first part is all about the iNaturalist app and getting comfortable with it. And then you have the bio blitz. There's also guides to developing a bio blitz from iNaturalist, which we will send you the links to. Sarah Spark says, was relatively easy to organize a bio blitz needed to have adults on hand to support the youth participants. Great suggestion. Yes, this type of event is great for all audiences, um, both young and old and, uh, and, and, from various degrees of um, knowledge with citizen science. So we encourage you to host a bio blitz. Oops, I clicked on the link. This is my favorite type of event just because I'm a little bit of an astronomy uh, nerd is a star party. So I know with the eclipse, um, a couple of years ago, libraries really, really got in, um, interested and invested in hosting these types of events. And there are some great citizen science projects that coincide with a star party, like the Globe at Night project, which is all about measuring light pollution. Um, there's NASA's Globe Observer. So you can make it a daytime star party, right? The sun is a star. Um, and so you can host a star party during the day too. And there are projects uh, on NASA's Globe Observer, like... Um, cloud, uh, making cloud observations that you can do during the day or the Globe at Night project, which is measuring light pollution. We encourage you to include volunteers from local astronomy clubs, 
uh, from NASA, NASA's Night Sky Network, the Inter International Dark Sky Association. There's a ton of different uh, databases of amateur astronomers that will come out to your event and they love coming out. And this is what they, they, their goal is, right? So partnering with somebody whose goal matches yours. Um, also, StarNet has a STEM clearinghouse of great activities that would um, that can coincide with a star party and uh, NASA University of Learning also has great STEM activities. And then we have that measuring light in the night build a kit guide that talks about all the materials that you might need to, to uh, participate in the Globe at Night project. Curious for anyone hosting star parties if there are any tips. Great, some great conversations happening in the chat. I've embedded links in this PowerPoint and now I keep clicking the link and it's taking me out of the PowerPoint, which will be helpful to you all when we send out the PowerPoint. You can click the link and go right to our resources. Another really popular one is hosting a pollinator event. And um, Lisa Lewis is gonna tell you about a real example of a pollinator event and, and um, all the resources she used to develop one. But we see libraries having pollinator gardens and really um, being interested in projects like the Great Sunflower Project and iNaturalist. Uh, for a pollinator event, it can look a lot of different ways. Um, one of which is inviting master gardeners or beekeepers to come. Uh, making sure that you're in contact with your state's university extension office. There's a lot of, again, databases of people like the American Beekeeping Federation that can um, you can reach out to for expertise. Um, we also have developed some fun uh, activities for younger youth to participate, like the, these pollinator coloring guides. We have the Observing Pollinators Kit that you can build and have alongside of, of your event. Um, and I'm uh, sorry, Lisa's going to tell you a lot more about that. So I'm not going to talk too much more about a pollinator event. And then a couple of other ideas. Host a workshop for youth. Many of you host after school or homeschool workshops. You can easily do a citizen science project as part of um, that workshop. And we can, we can help you with that. There's also project marathons. This image on the right is a... Um, catch-a-thon for the stall catchers project. So if this is like a day long marathon where you're contributing um, to data all day long, and this is an indoor project. So it's great for um, any location and can be done anywhere. And then of course the, the STEM activity clearinghouse that's curated by StarNet is a great place to look for um, additional activities to and, and citizen science projects that um, for those longer workshop model type of events. Uh, curious, so that was quick, I know, but I want to get to our speakers. Uh, I'm curious, of those uh, event types that you just heard, what are you most interested in? Amanda says, when you say you can help us with it, what do you mean? So you can email the library network um, email, and we will send you as many links and resources that we that we know of. So if you say, I'm looking for this type of activity, and I don't know where to find it, we are absolutely happy to, to send you in the right direction. Okay, so I have a poll. Is everyone seeing this poll? Am I frozen? No. It went away, somebody said. It disappeared. Okay. Relaunch poll. Let's see if that works. Did that work? So the, the question is, which of the event types are you most interested in learning more about? I think it's a multiple choice. So you can, someone said again, it went away. Okay, let me try it again. It's weird, I'm not doing anything on my end. Relaunch poll. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Hands are up, I'm not. I'm not touching my computer just in case I'm doing something to make it go away. So which type of event are you interested learning in learning more about? Looks like it might be all of them, <laughs> which is great. Robin or um, Starnet folks, I know we're about to you're about to present your, but any other thoughts as before we go into um Lisa's presentation. Robin, anything you want to add? Go for it. 
Uh, no, I think Lisa is going to be a great example of how you can um, take our resources and really and, and resources from other organizations and do an, an amazing um, program. So I'd say let's turn it over to Lisa. Wonderful. Let me just share the results. No problem, Darlene. Darlene said she didn't know that she could close the poll. <laughs> That's all right. So it looks like you all want to know about <laughs> all of them. So this is what our goal is for the next couple of months is to continue to share our resources with you um, to answer your emails uh, through our inbox. Diane has um, a question. What's the average cost to build a kit? That's a great question. We'll um, let Lisa present and then we will follow up with that question. So welcome Lisa Lewis, who is the library manager of the Florence Community Library and president of the Arizona Library Association. Hi, thank you so much for being allowed to be here today and kind of tell you about what we did when I was actually the library services manager for the city of Sholo. So we wanted to expand a little bit on the pollinator part of it, because where we were at up in the northern part of Arizona, lots of, of vegetation, lots of forests, lots of trails. And so we were wanting to kind of promote the pollinator part of citizen science. And primarily because I've always been really fascinated with with bees in particular, they scare me to death. And when they come next to me, I want to get out of the way. But I wanted to learn more about them so I could kind of understand what the importance of pollinators were. So we came up with this idea of a party for pollinators. We received some funding from the Tangled Bake Studios, which promoted the um, promoted and produced the film called My Garden of a Thousand Bees. And they provided some funding as well as providing packets of seeds that we could hand out to our community. So we wanted to take that particular project and kind of expand it into our citizen science um, program that we did for April. We also received a little bit of funding from NNLM as well um, through SciStarter and we received some LSTA funding from the Arizona State Library that helped us put together the kit. So we had several different funding sources that helped us put this together. So you can see our flyer here. We made it a, a family event. We asked everybody to kind of register for this because we were going to serve a light dinner that we could that we could with the funding that we received from the Tangled Bank Studios. Um, and then we had some different activities that we had planned um, and a couple of little giveaways that we did during this program. So all together, we had about 60 families that participated in this. Um, and then when they showed up for the event, we divided them up into different groups. And we had our bumblebees, we had our butterflies, we had our hummingbirds and we had our beetles and we divided them up into those groups and then they went to different stations and kind of alternated. So if you'll go to the next slide for me. So as you can see, these are a couple of the different groups that we had together. So library staff were the ones that did the stations, the breakout sessions that we had here for them to do some interactive activities to learn more about pollinators and to um, create things that could help them encourage the pollinators to either come to their backyard where they had some flowers or to go out to one of our meadows and do a seed bomb. So down at the bottom of the picture, you'll see um, that gentleman is putting together a seed bomb um, that he made and then he was able to take that home and then put it wherever he wanted to do. Um, and also up above at the top, we have a library staff member who's doing like a trivia game, like a Jeopardy game about pollinators, teaching a little bit more because a lot of folks do not realize how many different insects and birds and whatnot that are considered pollinators. And I think when you think of pollinators, you think of bees. And this kind of educated them a little bit more to tell them more about what pollinators are and, and what they can do. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, this one was we had a face painting station for the little ones. Um, in addition to making the seed bombs, they could come over and get their face painted of the pollinator of their choice. Um, this little girl chose a bee, obviously, and she just loved that. And she went around and showed her bee to everyone that was interested in seeing her bee. And then up above at the top, another library staff member was doing some tie dye handkerchiefs with natural dyes that come from flowers. Um, and that was a very popular event. Everybody was able to take something away there. 
Um, and so that was an idea to teach a little bit more about why it's important we have pollinators because it creates so many different um, things that we enjoy, our, our vegetables, our fruits, our flowers, all of those types of things that are extremely important. Okay, next slide. So this is a picture of the pollinator kits, the zombie hunting kits that we set out for folks to be able to look at, open them up, kind of go through it, see what the kits were about, get a little bit of an idea of what the kits would be or what they would be doing if they check these kits out. And then a picture of all of the seeds that were sent to us by this grant from Tangled Bank Studios. This is just a sampling of the seeds. There were way more seeds that we received from them. Um, we encouraged folks to take those seeds when they attended this event, and then we incorporated them into our seed library so that people could pick them up and plant. So it was wildflowers native to our area so that they would grow well. Um, and that was hugely popular. Those seeds went very quickly. Um, and hopefully we saw the results of that um, once they got them out there and got them planted. So, yeah, and, and Dolores, that's, this is only wildflower seeds as well um, and native to the area of where we were living at. And that was what this studio, this, this grant was all about. You had to tell them where you were from, what your area was like so that they could send you the seeds that would work best in that area. So go to the next slide, please. Hey, Lisa, I just want to really compliment you on the way you um, introduced the, the kits you had by using this program. That was a great display and a great way to do that. Yeah, and I'm going to tell, I'm going to share a story about that when I'm done with this. Um, that was very, to me, it was kind of like this success story that you want to hear about when you do a program like this. So this shows you kind of a, a wide event, um, a wide picture of what the actual dinner part of it looked like. This is where we also invited a beekeeper to come and share um, his experiences as a beekeeper. We did not get any pictures of him and I'm, I'm very disappointed that we didn't get any pictures of him, but he brought some honeycomb. He talked about his bees. He is a local beekeeper. So beekeeping can happen all over the country. It doesn't matter where you are. And he, it was very interesting to listen to him about his experiences beekeeping, some of um, the mistakes that he's learned along the way, and how now because he's a big a beekeeper and people know that they call him all of the time to remove bees from their area. They're not necessarily bees that he's going to keep for himself. He can relocate them, but once you're a beekeeper, everybody just wants to reach out to you. It seems like so. Um, the top picture you see is a display of all of the citizen science kits that went along with the pollinator party. Um, down below is our table set up. We had 60 families. We were quite crowded in our programming space there, but everyone really enjoyed it. Um, we also gave everyone a sample of local honey that we purchased at a local nature shop. So everyone received a little jar of honey there with the, with the little spoon that goes with it. And that was, was very successful. Everybody really liked that. And we all know what the benefits are of local honey um, as far as allergies and helping you with that kind of thing. So it was a really great program. Um, we had quite a few people that asked a lot of different questions, did not know anything about citizen science until we hosted this program. Even though we had had some kits in our library prior to this, um, we had not really had a big program to introduce them. So this was a way to do that. The, my favorite story from this event is we had a couple of older ladies who are, they're widows, they're friends, they do a lot of things together and they have come to many of our library events. So they came to this event primarily because it was gonna be a free meal. But after that, they, they, inter, they interacted with every station they asked all kinds of questions. They were very engaged and very um, excited and they were learning some new things. And one of the ladies um, at the end was talking to me about one of the kits in specific, which was the zombie hunting kit. Um, and she said, I'm gonna come back to the library and I'm gonna check that out. And so you hear that a lot, but you know, and sometimes they do come back, but so I really didn't expect her to come back, especially since this, this lady was about 88 years old um, she did come back the next day. She came up to the circulation desk. She was asking about the kit. She couldn't remember what the name of it was. She just can kind of describe it. And so then she was talking to one of my staff who then came back to my office and said, there's an older lady here who's asking about one of our citizen science kits that I think she's talking about 
the zombie hunter, but that can't possibly be it. She's like 88 years old. There, there's no way that she would want to check this out. And so I went up there to see who it was, and it was indeed her. And of course, she wanted to check it out. So citizen science is for all age groups. Everybody can participate in that. Everybody can contribute to ongoing research, which is extremely important, and feel like they've made a contribution or they've made an impact in their community. So this was highly successful. Um, I'm not sure if Sholo is going to do it again this year. But now that I am the library manager in Florence, you can bet that we're going to be doing something similar to that this year. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer it. Thank you so much, Lisa. Please ask Lisa questions. She's such a great resource. Dolores says, where did you get the seed ball activity? So that is on StarNet. I believe that was on StarNet that we found that activity. There's all kinds of different um, resources that you can reach out to make those seed bombs. Um, and when we were doing this and collecting the material for it, we also found out that there was another organization, another group, and I'm not sure who they were right now, but they were able to put seeds into um, bullets. And then when they would go out and do target shooting, those bullets would explode and the seeds would go everywhere. And that was that was a really fun way to hear of how they were distributing seeds. And so depending on the community that you lived in, Sholo is, had all kinds of different gun ranges around. So that would be an awesome way to distribute those seeds. And I tried to find that, look, you know, where I could find that and just didn't get that done in time. But that's another another idea. But as far as making a seed bomb, you can you can find those pretty much all over, but I believe we got ours from StarNet. That's great. Yes, which is a great segue because StarNet's gonna tell us about their resources now. So welcome Claire and Dylan and take it away. Awesome, thank you, Tara. <clears throat> and thanks Lisa for that presentation. It's so, you love seeing like actual pictures and stories of like how all of these resources can look in a library. Um, so that was really amazing. Um, but yeah, my name is Claire Radcliffe Adams. I'm an education associate at the Star Library Network. Um, and we're just going to talk really quickly about some of the resources um, that we have available for you all and how you can get involved um, with planning your citizen science events. Next slide, please. So if you haven't heard about us yet, um, here's just a really brief overview of who we are. Um, so the Star Library Network, or StarNet for short, is part of the National Center for Interactive Learning, which is a part of the Space Science Institute located in Boulder, Colorado. Um, the Institute ha has a huge research component. We have researchers all around the world um, that are NASA funded. And then we also have our education team um, who runs StarNet. Um, so through StarNet, we've built a community of over 8,000 library professionals interested in STEAM, so science, technology, engineering, art, and math activities, exhibitions, and kits for their patrons. And you can learn more about us at starnetlibraries.org and some of the opportunities we have. Um, we receive federal funding from NASA, the National Science Foundation, and um, multiple other different funding agencies. Um, and because of that, we are able to provide free training, exhibitions, kits, and eclipse glasses, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so it's at no cost to you. So anything that you are involved with with us, we will cover the cost of trainings, send you exhibits for free, um, and um, all kinds of great stuff. Um, as Tara has mentioned, one of our big things that we run is the STEM Activity Clearinghouse. It has over 500 vetted STEM activities that we vet, we vet the source to make sure the science is correct. So most things you'll see on there is um, from NASA or from NOAA or other um, agencies that really have solid science behind those activities. So it's not something you might just find on Pinterest, you know, that might, you know, might have some faulty information. We make sure we vet that. And then we do an additional vetting to find uh, activities that work great in libraries. We know that the educational programs that you provide um, are different than what you might find in a formal education setting like a school. So we're really trying to find activities that will work well 
And then our activities on the clearinghouse are often reviewed by library staff. And so sometimes they're like, hey, this one is not gonna work. You know, so we wanna make sure um, the practitioners that we're working for have a say in what's on the activity clearinghouse. And you can access that at clearinghouse.starnetlibraries.org. Um, we also host a community social media site with project specific groups and general interest STEM resource groups. So this is kind of like our version of Facebook. I think Dylan gave it the, the name Spacebook. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a place where you can connect with other libraries doing STEM. There's, you can like posts, you can upload things um, like your experience doing STEM and, and see what else, what else other libraries are doing. So that's who we are at StarNet. Um, next slide, please. So we're going to talk with you today a little bit about what's coming up with the 2023 and 2024 eclipses and how this is a great opportunity to do citizen science. Um, so there are two eclipses coming up. On October 14th, 2023, there is an annular solar eclipse. That's where the, um, the moon is a little bit farther away from Earth so it doesn't quite fully cover the sun. There's a little ring around it. You can see in that icon. Um, and that's going from about from Oregon, that path of annularity goes down through Texas. Um, and then a year later, April 8th, 2024, uh, we will be able to see a total solar eclipse. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, there's a lot of excitement um, because the next, a total eclipse to cross the continent 20, uh, 2045. So this is really a great chance to um, share solar science excitement with your patrons um, and experience a total solar eclipse or an annular eclipse, depending on the year. Um, next slide. So we have received funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to provide approximately 5 million eclipse glasses to public libraries in the US, DC, and five territories. We are providing in-person training to each state and territory. So if you're curious as to when we will be coming to your state, uh, feel free to send us an email and we can, we can um, let you know when we're coming to your state. We are also providing circulating kits to all of the state libraries which includes solar telescopes, um, binoculars, all kinds of really fun things to engage your patrons with. Um, an ongoing menu of trainings. Um, so again, we have those in-person trainings and we're also offering online trainings if you're unable to join your state library. Um, and then again, that interactive community on our website that you can talk and share ideas with other libraries. So that community will provide um, access to an interactive community, vetted hands-on activities specifically relating to solar science and the eclipses, including a couple of citizen science projects you can get involved with, and then also access to scientists, volunteers, and uh, eclipse su subject matter experts. So if you're part of that online community, we can help be a matchmaker for you to find an expert in your community. And I'm going to pass it over to Dylan now to talk a little bit more about the specific citizen science resources we are offering about the eclipse. Thanks, Claire. Uh, so we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. Uh, so if you're interested in getting started with citizen science through the solar eclipse activities for libraries project, um, ooh, can we get the next slide move, moving through? Uh, there's a fantastic getting started with deal blog post. Um, and if uh, you want to go ahead and scan uh, the uh, QR code on the screen, um, the link will also should be available in the link deck. And I'll go ahead and provide a link to that in the chat right now. Um, the Getting Started with Steel blog post is the our one-stop shop for all the resources we're going to be sending out, which includes a link to register for the free solar viewing glasses and the Steel newsletter, which we'll be providing up. Uh, the Steel newsletter is really the best way uh, to keep in touch with all things Steel, including some of our citizen science research. Uh, that link has, uh, or that that blog post has links to our virtual trainings. We're in the middle of our introductory virtual trainings right now. Um, and uh, we're going to be providing links to recorded versions of all of those trainings. We also have Eclipse Science resources and links to how to get involved with citizen science 
uh, through solar science related citizen science projects uh, through NASA that they're making available. We are also going to be doing a series of virtual trainings all about citizen science and eclipse programming. Uh, we've just scheduled those. The registration for those is open right now. Um, we're holding those April 12th, April 25th, May 4th, and May 16th. The link to which uh, the to register uh, for those is also in that Getting Started with Seal blog post. Uh, and we're going to be using uh, Five Starters' fantastic uh, document on how to get citizen science uh, going at your library with Eclipse programming. And we're going to be using that as a guide to walk, uh, walk you through like an example program of how to find different uh, hands-on activities, how to find partners, and uh, talking about a couple of different specific Eclipse-related solar uh, citizen science programs uh, that you can participate with at your library. Can we get going to the next slide? So uh, in addition to how to get started with those data science and resources and joining us for those webinars, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the STEM Activity Clearinghouse is a really fantastic resource uh, for finding hands-on activities that we have vetted for you to verify the science. And many, 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 many have been tested in libraries and are ready to go right out of the box. We have a couple of collections on there that you might find really relevant. Um, uh, we have the uh, Eclipse Activity Collection, which is uh, all about uh, the steel uh, the, the steel project. You know, activities in there all about the eclipse. We also have a specific citizen science collection, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and include a link to that citizen science collection right there in the chat. Um, and then we have many, many more activities. So if you find a citizen science project uh, that you find on there, you can actually look for some related hands-on activities on the STEM Activity Clearinghouse to really incorporate and have some all-encompassing program where you're not just doing the citizen science, uh, but also having other types of programming you can do in concurrent on there. Also included in that getting started with steel blog posts is some links to how to find uh, partners through the Solar System Ambassadors, uh, the Night Sky Network, which is a really fantastic project through JPL to collect, uh, to connect librarians and other informal education uh, sites with uh, local astronomy clubs and local uh, space science enthusiast clubs. So that's really cool. Uh, and then we are also going to be um, uh, releasing a directory on how to connect with specifically uh, vetted Eclipse uh, subject matter experts uh, that we are going to also be um, uh, sharing out with you. So these are just a brief overview of some of the Eclipse resources that are involved with uh, that we're going to be making available through the field project that are related to citizen science. And I really invite you to register for that webinar uh, for one of those webinars. Uh, to learn even more about how step-by-step uh, -step how to incorporate citizen science into some Eclipse programming at your library. Wonderful. This will not be the last that you hear from us about the Eclipse, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's going to be a big focus in the next um, 12 months or even more, I guess it's next April. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be really exciting as you all know, from last time, libraries were such an important part of our effort to um, have engagement around the eclipse. So please sign up for those. We'll include those links in our follow-up email. Uh, are there dates multiple? Are those dates multiple opportunities for the same training? Uh, question from Sheila. Are those the same training a couple of times, Dylan? Or uh, we're still looking to see we're, we're I'm hoping to get a couple of different projects. So there might be a couple of different projects that come and talk about their specific Eclipse uh, citizen science project at those trainings. Uh, but after we, we uh, have completed all the trainings, there will also be a recorded uh, a recording we'll put on our Starnet YouTube page that will have uh, kind of a compilation of everything from the trainings uh, available as well. Uh, so feel free to sign up for one if you want to be involved with one live, but then where there will also be that compilation video that will incorporate all of the things we've covered in all four of those trainings. Uh, so even if you, you can only make it to one, you'll still have access to all that information after the last training is done. Thank you so much. All right, so you've heard a bunch of different resources from us, and we will send everything in the follow up and everything is going to live on citizenscienceMonth.org um, shortly as we revamp that website to be more um, streamlined for you to be able to find all of these resources. There's kind of two additional steps that we hope that you take in planning Citizen Science Month events. The first is to add your event to the SciStarter event finder. Um, the reasons for this are to help people learn about your event. If you're in a rural area, um, if you are wanting to get more interest, 
that we really encourage you to add your event here. We are going to be promoting Citizen Science Month events throughout March and April to get people signed up um, virtually or in person. So please add your event. The second reason is to help us measure collective impact. We want to see our uh, how how big Citizen Science Month this um, Citizen Science Month events go and reach this year. We want to know about your audiences. So one of those ways to help us do that is to add your events. Um, finally, we are developing some evaluation tools, some event um, surveys. Um, our our evaluators at Arizona State University are developing these, and you will have access to these. And um, if you sign up and add your event, we're going to be reaching back out to you. Um, you can send out the survey in, uh, in, um, at your event, or you can request a unique link, and that will be your own survey with, you know, tools and data, and you'll get that data back. Uh, and these are vetted evaluation tools. So we really, really encourage you to add your events for those reasons. Um, and even if your event is private, you can just indicate that we, uh, that it's a private event and that it, you, uh, there's no sign up for it. Um, we still would like to have that information as far as uh, measuring the collective impact of Citizen Science Month. So please add your events and then promote your events. Robin mentioned some of our promotional materials. We have a ton of other promotional materials. Here's a bookmark. Um, there are social media assets that you can use. Um, there are, there's a toolkit, a social media toolkit. Um, there are press releases that you can, that sample press releases. So we've tried to think of soup to nuts from introducing your communities to citizen science through our, um, through our training, through some of those early kind of passive engagement through choosing events, planning events, adding the events and promoting events. Um, this is what Citizen Science Month is all about. And it really takes all of us to, to make it happen. And somebody asked a great question before, how are you going to help us? We are here, we have our, we put our emails in the chat. Um, the library network at scistarter.org email is specifically for questions about um, the for libraries and other community-based organizations. So if you email us there, we will respond to you. Multiple people check that email. That's actually where the, the follow-up email for this webinar is going to come from. So you'll have that email. You can respond right to there and say, hey, I want to host a pollinator event, and I forget what that resource is that you talked about, or do you know a great activity for this age group? That is our our goal and our job. We also, I didn't add it to these slides, um, but we have a, we have our own Facebook group for citizen science and libraries. Um, we'll send that in the follow-up. And I think that's another great place to share resources and, um, and chat together, right? You are all, we're hoping to build this community of practice around citizen science and libraries and community-based organizations are um, really becoming hubs. So do I have another poll? I think I do. Oh, no, that, that I, I do have one more, but it, it's not to this question. The question now, we have some time, about five minutes for any additional questions. Start thinking about how might you participate in Citizen Science Month this year. You can type that in the chat. Um, if you have other questions, please, this is a great time to type it in the chat. As we're doing that, we have one additional poll. You know, we're planning our own events for Citizen Science Month. We're curious, what is the best time to host PD opportunities for libraries and community-based organizations? Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, weekends? Is it in the morning? Uh, is it in the afternoon, later in the evening? So please um, go ahead and complete that poll so that we can best suit your needs as we plan these events. And Please um, type your questions in the chat. Our next upcoming webinar for the Library Network is all together now, Citizen Science in your summer reading program on March 29th, we'll send that. So PD is professional development, Diane, thank you for that question. PD at professional development opportunities. Uh, yeah, so our next event is all together now, Citizen Science in your summer reading program. Um, we are partnering with uh, summer reading folks to think about how citizen science fits into this year's theme, and we're going to be um, curating some some resources for you to uh, use this summer as you plan for summer reading. Any other questions? Oh, Diane asks again. Average cost of building a kit. It really depends on the type of kit. I would say the cheapest kit is observing pollinators. I can show you um, the website. And actually, before I do that, let me put the um, the link to the evaluation in the chat. So please complete yeah. our evaluation. <laughs> Yeah, is that what you're going to say, Robin? Well, no, but yeah, complete our evaluation, please. It's very helpful. But in regards to kit costs, we have a couple kits 
that the research um, demands specific instrumentation. Um, so if you do use a sky quality meter for measuring light in the night to help with um, light pollution research, that's about $112 um, tool. Um, if you're doing the air um, outdoor monitoring air quality, oh gosh, I think that's um, you know well over a hundred dollars. To gosh, is that it, it, it's it's a, a you know more expensive sensor. So um, to Tara's point, it doesn't um, depend on the uh, equipment or tools needed in the kit for the or research. I'm just going to share um, the kit building page so that you all know what it looks like. So here are the guides. If you click on, let's say you want to build the measuring light in the night guide, um, it'll take you to an overview of the kit. And then there are clickable links here um, for what things cost. And again, there are some things that we do not substitute, like the sky quality meter, but then there are other things that you can find cheaper or source them in different places. So it really depends on the kit. I would say the pollinator kit is a great kit to start with. Um, it has some tools here that you may even have um, in your library. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, and to Lisa's point about LSTA grants, um, usually administered by state libraries, um, Arizona is a fantastic model. Um, they've offered specific citizen science LSTA grants for several years. This year, they're just saying, if you want to use it for citizen science, just apply for a general LSTA grant and you know, explain what you're going to do. So um, if if that's of interest, um, you know, talk to your state libraries and see if you can uh, use LSTA funds to help fund this. Other funding sources might be your friends of the library. Or um, if you really want to go big, there's the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences and NLM, as Lisa's uh, showing, and even your uh, local service groups like Rotary and Kiwanis. Don't forget about them. Lots of times they're just dying to find out local projects that they can fund. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, and we can stay on for a few more minutes if others have questions. Uh, but thank you all again for joining us today. We will see you hopefully on in March, and we will we look forward to seeing all of the events that you uh, post and are planning for Citizen Science Month. Thank you. We hope this was a useful webinar to you today. Thanks.